Today we're going to look at two higher end options that are new to the Android emulation space and are at about the same price point of $200, so let's talk about that. Before we get started, if you haven't already watched, please check out these two videos here where I do an in-depth review of both of these handhelds so you can get more information about them. For these particular units, these are actually the retail units I purchased with my own money. These are not the pre-production or review units that might have been seen in other videos. I plunked down my real hard-earned cash to check these handhelds out, so I will give you my unbiased opinions here. So in front of us here today, we have the Ioneo Pocket Micro and the Retroid Pocket Mini. Both of these handhelds come in just around the $200 price point and have a little bit higher end aesthetics and performance than the bargain handhelds you might see coming out of companies like Pow Kitty and Ambernick. So let's take a look and see if they are worth their price tags and which one of these handhelds might be best for you. Talking about performance, in the Pocket Micro we have the Helio G99 and in the Retroid Pocket Mini we have the Snapdragon 865. The Retroid Pocket Mini is a little bit more powerful than the Pocket Micro, so it does get an edge there. And of course, we do have a nice OLED screen here in the Pocket Micro at 3.7 inches versus the 3.5 inch 3.2 aspect ratio on the Pocket Micro here, which is a IPS panel. Albeit a good one, it's still not OLED. So let's dive into a little bit more about these devices. I'll briefly show the specs up here on the screen. They both have six gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage, so we are mostly comparing apples to apples here as far as specs. The Pocket Micro does have options with more RAM and storage, but I don't think that they are gonna make a huge impact on performance. So first up, let's just take a look at the sizes of these two devices. I'm using a little spacer here for the Pocket Micro so that it is flush with the mini in terms of the face of the device so that the size comparisons and screen comparisons are as accurate as possible today. So as you can see, these are nearly identical in width the micro comes in at just a little bit narrower, but is significantly less tall with that 3-2 aspect ratio than the micro. And of course, when we are standing these on edge here, you will see that the Retroid Pocket Mini is thicker. Well, it's not maybe thicker at the thinnest point. They are about the same, but the micro here doesn't have these bumps that the mini does. And from the side profile here, you can kind of see how those ergonomics stack up to each other. That being said, next thing I want to talk about is just kind of the finish and feel and overall design of these devices. So for the pocket micro here, I will say that this one gets the edge in materials and design. I know that the brick rectangular shape is a little bit polarizing in the community and some people think that it's not that attractive. I personally think that this is actually a beautiful handheld, you know, a little bit of a shiny boy, but both of them are. I just really like the finish and the materials. In fact, I actually like this black better than the review unit that was the retro gray that I borrowed from Stubbs, just because it has this really nice, soft feeling matte black metal frame, which just, it really feels very premium to touch along with the glass front. The plastic on the back here, you can see, well, it does get a little bit of smudgy from your finger oils, but it is a nice softer touch and maybe even slightly better than the plastic on the retro gray one. I don't know if that's because that was a pre-production or if it's just the different colors are slightly different, but overall design is really quite striking on this. It can be a little polarizing. I think it looks better than the Retro Pocket Mini. I think the Retro Pocket Mini looks like a little bit of a uh, Fisher Price children's toy, but it's not unattractive. It definitely has a bit of that Vita aesthetic. You can certainly see the influence here when you look at it, but it is its own beast design-wise. However, probably leads to it being a little bit more comfortable. The plastic on here is just okay, as I mentioned in my video. Maybe not the most premium feeling, but I wouldn't say that it's a bad device in terms of feel for any stretch, and it fits nicely in the palm of your hands here. Speaking of how it fits into your palms, let's just quickly talk about the ergonomics of these two devices here. And I think you kind of know what's coming. After all, this device is a rectangle. It is not bad to hold. It's a lot more comfortable than I think people give it credit for. However, it's not what you buy when you're thinking of the ultimate ergonomic device, especially if you're using these trigger and bumper buttons on the device, they can be a little bit harder to reach. When you're holding the device flat like this, it's really actually not that bad, but if you're playing in a recline position and you're holding it more upright like this towards your face, it gets a little bit more clunky to kind of hold on to that rectangular shape, but it does really feel nice in the hands with the premium materials. 
The Retroid Pocket Mini, on the other hand, really kind of conforms and wraps to your fingers and your thumbs sit in pretty much just the right position here for a D-pad gaming session. For joysticks, it's not quite as good, but the same could be said about the Micro over here. So I think overall, the ergonomics nod definitely goes to the Retroid Pocket Mini. And as I showed before, it does have these little bump outs, so that makes it feel a little bit better in the hands. I definitely would think I could play a lot longer session on the Mini than the Micro. So let's jump over to controls, because those are sort of related to the ergonomics on the devices and see kind of how those stack up to each other. I'm just gonna bring up the gamepad testers here so you have a little visual representation of what I am doing. All right, so starting at the top, we have the bumpers for the devices. Now, obviously we do have a bit of a big compromise here with the Ioneo Micro. I swear I'm gonna mess up those two names, Micro and Mini at some point during this video. Anyways, on the Micro, the bumpers are up here. They're flat. They're a nice feeling button and they're not loud at all. They're really a satisfying click. So I really give Ionia the nod in terms of the button feeling. The R1 is very clicky on the Retroid Pocket Mini here. It doesn't feel quite as nice and the plastic is not quite as nice as what's used on the Ioneo, but it is more comfortable to hold and use. As far as the triggers, well, I mean, I think it's sort of no contest there. There's really not a trigger on the micro. It is a digital button. For the games that you're playing on this, it's probably not gonna be that big of a deal, but if you want to play games that have analog control, then no question, the Mini is 100% the way to go here. Moving over to the joysticks, let's take a look at their smoothness and range here. Obviously, the Pocket Micro here has a switch size joystick with a little bit less range of motion, and we have the Retroid joysticks here, which have a little bit more freedom. They also do have a full square output if that's important to you. Now you can turn on the higher sensitivity on this device to get the square output, but by default you are going to get this circle. The Retroid really doesn't have any dead zones and it's smooth and recenters nicely. The Ioneo, as I've shown before, has a pretty large dead zone by default. And even if you turn that off, then you do have the issue that it can get a little fiddly in the middle there. I don't know if you could see when I very first opened up this app, my left joystick isn't perfectly centered. You know, I can move around a little bit and it's kind of going back to center, but I don't really have that issue at all. The micro is always going back to exactly where it needs to go. I do recommend leaving the dead zone or range adjustment on on the Ioneo just so that you don't have to deal with that. But if you're playing an accurate game, you may have to fiddle because the dead zone might be too large on that device. So again, here I would give the nod to the mini on the joystick. Another thing that I kind of like about the mini and the sticks is how they have recess them here so they don't really stick out a whole lot. On the micro, it, it's a little bit more obvious how much it sticks out. And I've thought about designing little nubs for it, but even if you take off the cap, the shaft here is pretty long, so you'd almost have to like chop it down if you wanted to make it smaller. So yep, joysticks are better on the Retroid Pocket Mini. They're smoother and have a better range and a better dead zone recentering. So that's a bit of Unfortunately, a no contest there. Nod goes to the Retroid Pocket Mini on that one. So, so far, you know, the Mini is kind of winning most categories other than the membrane feel of the bumpers on this being better. But now we are getting to the two things where, in my opinion, the Pocket Micro takes a big win. And the first is the buttons. If you've watched my reviews, you know that I ranted about these dang face buttons on the Retroid Pocket Mini and how loud they were. And if you can hear here, the micro is blessedly silent. So noise-wise, these are bad. And I, I, I've had some more time to play the Retroid Pocket Mini since my initial review. And I can say that I've gone from just sort of not liking the buttons to almost hating these buttons. Honestly, it is almost a deal breaker on this device for me. And I'm not just talking about the volume, I'm talking about, yes, they're loud, but they have a lot of travel. And the way it feels is just weird to me. It's like this kind of, not the most smoothest, there's definitely like an actuation point where it kind of like buckles. And then sometimes it almost feels like it's not gonna snap back right away, even though it does. Just like overall, they're kind of gross feeling buttons. Like, I'm sorry, Retroid, but you knocked it out of the park with this device in general, but please, do some better face buttons. I'm hoping that maybe we can see some mods, maybe even a kit from Retroid to have a different membrane and different height buttons to improve the feel there. And I really hope that the Retroid Pocket 5 does a better job with its face buttons or else that'll be a bit of a disappointment. So in contrast, these this is the best part about the micro. These are some of the best small face buttons I've 
I think I've ever used. Like, that's high praise. But, you know, I spent $200 on this device. I'm not making this stuff up. These are awesome buttons. The, the plastic has almost this nice soft touch to it compared to the harder plastic on the Mini. They have this nice rounded edge. The travel is just right. They raise just the right amount and they're quiet. These are just really, really, really nice face buttons to use. As far as the D-pads go, a little less clear cut. It kind of comes down to a style preference. On the Mini here, you have these little bit more clicky, dome switch style, I believe, buttons, which are good for if you want a more tactile feel, but it is a little smaller. On the micro here, you have a larger D-pad. And again, the plastic here is so nice. I think it's better than the pre-production sample. It's like smooth, but it's not smooth. It's got a little bit of texture to it, but it's so little that it almost feels smooth without being glossy. It just, it's really, really nice to touch. I really like the amount of travel and the stiffness, and I'm not really getting any false diagonals on here any more so than I would on the Mini. So it is also an excellent D-pad. I, I rate the both D-pads as pretty great on both of these, and it really comes down to whether you prefer a bit more of a clicky dome switch style or a more traditional membrane style. I would say that for the face buttons and D-pad, if you're playing games that are only using these inputs, the Micro is better. I'm just gonna go out and say it. I know uh, everybody really loves RP Mini. Micro has better face buttons. The Micro has a better D-pad. So hopefully Retroid can improve on the face buttons on their device. But before we go on too long, that's it for the controls. So let's move on to some of the other things. I wanna take a brief moment to take about software. So the, the Mini, I think, has a little bit more bare bones software suite. I really like what iNeo does with their software, having the side menu that has so many different options, toggles that you can pick, performance. You can even dive deep into your performance modes, adjust individual clock settings. There is so much there, and you don't necessarily have to touch all of it and get overwhelmed, but it's there if you need it. And they also have the best overlay on any Android device as far as showing frames per second and that kind of stuff over up at the top. Let's see if I can toggle that on here. Got a lot of little statistics on the Retroid. You just get the FPS meter on the top left if you want to do that. You can see a couple other things on the pullout menu when it is present. Let me just pop into an emulator to summon that, but they're not there all the time. They're only there when you pull out the side menu. That being said, I'm going to do a quick rant here about the software on the micro. Now, I had the Pocket S before, and that had its software glitches. There were bugs that were introduced. Most of the time, they're quick to fix them, and I'll give credit to INEO that they are rapidly releasing updates for their devices on Android now, so they're definitely paying attention, but I just wish that some of the updates were checked a little bit better before being pushed out to devices. In the case of the Micro here, I've been having some issues with the controller since I first received this device. Now, when I say that, I mean the device is working properly, but they added some modes for the controller in recent updates to have the Xbox or Ioneo style. And this Ioneo style is supposed to allow games like Dead Cells to work without crashing and uh, allow some additional remapping. But unfortunately that mode doesn't work for me because I am still stuck on firmware version one for the device. You can see here, handset firmware. Oh, actually it says negative one now, which is new as of right now looking at this video. Really don't understand what that indicator does. But what happened is I first got the device, I went into the update here and I had four updates listed. And I'm gonna throw a crappy iPhone video that I took when I was doing that on the screen here so you can see what happened. There was four updates and when I would try to tap on the bottom update to update the handset firmware, it would tell me, you need to update the other applications first. So I did, one by one I went through and updated those. But when I updated the settings app, because that's the app that I'm in, it would force closed out, which is normal, and then reopen in the new version. But the handset firmware update was gone, magically disappeared. I was never able to apply it because it was a catch 22. It said, update these other apps and then you can do the firmware, but I'd update those other apps and the firmware would disappear. So I really don't understand what was going on there. So I'm hoping that some updates can come out that allow us to better update the handset firmware and fix that. The rest of the software on the device has been fine so far. You can listen to my thoughts about iSpace and my Pocket S or Pocket Micro full videos where I talk a little bit about how there's still some room for growth there. But I do think that INEO has the best quick menu 
out of any Android device I've used. So I'll give it props for that. As of right now, my device works, but there's even been some people in the INEA Discord that their controller stopped working after they did a handset firmware update and haven't been able to recover it yet. I'm certain that the issues will get fixed. They are paying attention and fixing them. I don't think they're leaving anybody high and dry. It just sucks when you buy a brand new device and you're essentially beta testing the software. Just make sure that your software works appropriately when you send out devices to people that have paid for them. So that's enough for software. Again, not a lot to say about the RP Mini. The software is there and it works. You know, I think Retroid is a little bit more patch stuff if absolutely necessary, but kind of more bare bones. And you know, that's totally fine in it and it works. It does what it needs to do, just doesn't have quite as many bells and whistles. All right, to test out audio quality, I am going to shamelessly use a video of me playing guitar so that I don't get any copyright strike claims here. So take a quick listen. First up, we have the INEO Pocket Micro. And now let's listen to the Retroid Pocket Mini. So as you may be able to hear in the video, or maybe not because you are just listening to a microphone in my room, the Retroid Pocket Mini does have a clearer sound. It doesn't have a lot of bass. It's not the best speakers in the business, but unfortunately it does outclass the micro in terms of the audio as far as the micro is concerned. I already ranted about this for a really long time in my INEO video, but conspicuously you can see that there is no headphone jack on the micro. And unfortunately, due to the way they have hooked up the controller in this device, you can't use USB audio interface, USB headphones at the same time as the controller. So there's no way to get wired headphone audio output while playing a game out of this device using the inbuilt controller. Whereas of course, that's not an issue at all with the Retroid Pocket Mini since we have a headphone jack on there. Hopefully that's something they can fix. I emailed them after my first review to let them know about it and they said that they would look into it. But at this point, I do not have any updates stating whether they are or are not able to fix that. So if you're a headphones user and you don't like Bluetooth latency, then you're kind of stuck with only the Retroid Pocket Mini here and kind of knocks Micro out of any competition for that. I'm not going to talk too much about performance, but let's go ahead and take a look at screen sizes in games. I'm going to prop this up so that we have as close of a comparison as possible on the camera. Let's pull up a couple games and take a look at what that looks like. Let's start off with a 1-1 system. We'll bring up a Game Boy Color game. Integer scaling is off. Both of these have a high enough PPI that I'm not too concerned about it. And I wanna show you the full effect of the screen size. Okay, so you can see here that for Game Boy, Game Boy Color, systems with more of the 1-1 or maybe even 8-7 if you're playing that ratio on the Super Nintendo, that the Retroid Pocket Mini is definitely way bigger here. And the bezels disappear a bit more, of course, because of the OLED, although the screen is not bad here on the micro. You may also notice in the video that the micro has a distinctly warmer tone to its colors. I turned on the saturation adjustments off. This is the default color profile for both devices to make it a fair and balanced playing field. What's funny is I actually never really noticed that this device was particularly warm in the display until I put them both next to each other and saw that the Mini has a much cooler image. I don't know necessarily which one is more accurate. I think they maybe kind of in between. This one might go a little bit cool in the spectrum and this might go a little warm on the spectrum. So let's hop up to the next one and take a look at a 4-3 system. For that, I'm gonna hop over to Super Nintendo. I'm not playing with the date seven today. We're gonna do 4-3 for comparisons. You can see here 4-3 is still bigger on the Retroid Pocket Mini, of course, because it's 3.7 and native 4-3. Whereas here you're 3.5 with a 3-2 aspect ratio. So you are going to lose out a little bit on the space there. And here you can get a pretty good idea of what that size difference looks like. And now hopping over to 16.9, I've got PSP up on the screen. We're just going to look at the menu on Wipeout now because that white rectangle gives you a good idea. The gap is very close here because the 3.2 display is wider than it is tall. 16.9 content works pretty well on it with pretty minimal bezels on the top and bottom. Bezels are bigger on the Mini, however, you can't really see them because of the OLED. Probably the only reason you can even tell on camera that the screen is there is because I have the frames per second counter open. But it does look kind of funny how chunky these strips are, of course, in a dark room, that doesn't matter. Uh, I don't really care that much about how thick the bezels are as long as the device is comfortable and the screen is nice, but some people do obsess over that. So yeah, I mean, 
I guess you've got less bezels here. But I would say that the difference here is pretty negligible. These are almost the exact same size. And both of these consoles are gonna run PSP just fine. The G99 has enough power to run that at two or three X upscale. So you're gonna get pretty much native resolution on either device when playing PSP. And of course this competition wouldn't make sense without showing a through to aspect ratio system, which both of these devices are pretty good for, which is the Game Boy Advance. Uh, as you can see here, Kind of like the 16.9 content were almost identical. Maybe it's even closer. Like, th th I think the Retroid Pocket Mini is hair. I can't even tell if it's a camera angle. They are so close that I wouldn't really say that either is a major difference. So here you do have bezels, but they mostly disappear because of the screen. Here you've got no bezels at all for Game Boy Advance. I think Game Boy Advance is a system that really leverages what the micro is all about here. The one system where this device might make more sense than the Retroid Pocket Mini, especially if you prioritize something that is a little bit narrower and slimmer overall, but maybe OLED is just too good to overlook, even if it has those annoying buttons. I'm not gonna go too in-depth on performance today. You can check out some of Retroid Handheld's other videos to get a bit more information on the performance that each of these devices can put out for you. But I just wanted to do a quick one game comparison so you could get a rough idea here. So on the Retroid Pocket Mini here, and I put both of these on Vulkan just because for fairness sake, Vulkan runs better on the micro than OpenGL. Whereas in some cases, OpenGL is smoother on the mini, but we'll just do both Vulkan and we'll take a look at that. So here we have God of War running at 2.25x on the mini. It's running fine. So let's bump that up and see where we hit a breakpoint. We're on graphics, we're gonna hit 3x. And here we are starting to see some slowdowns, although it is mostly running. Um, a little closer to the camera here, looks like we are getting like 96, 98%. That's right at the performance threshold. So 3x is maybe a hair too much for the Retroid Pocket Mini to handle but anything under that on God of War is running just fine. So for comparison, let's take a look at the micro now. So as you can see here, we are at one X and we are already only getting 88% on God of War here. We're occasionally running at 100%, but it's definitely getting some slowdowns here and there. So I'm not even gonna bump up the resolution. So that gives us a pretty clear idea that we're just under one X and just under 3x, so we're getting a significantly larger amount of performance out of the micro. So if you're gonna play any significant chunk of the GameCube and PS2 catalog, no question you're gonna want the Retroid Pocket Mini for that. The micro can handle some GameCube and some PS2 in a pinch, and some games better than others, but it's certainly not a console that I would get just for those systems. That's more secondary to what it is best at. I would pick this more if you're gonna do maybe a Game Boy Advance, some PSP, and then a little bit of the older systems if you don't mind the slightly smaller screen. Okay, I wanted to take a quick check out on the fans. I believe I cover both of these in their respective videos, but I just want you to hear that in the sport or max mode here, the micro is not incredibly loud, but has a bit of a high pass twine. And on the micro, on the max fan, it's definitely lower pitched. It's about the same volume. I do think it's a little less obtrusive because of that lower pitch. But on both devices, I don't know that the Max fan is particularly necessary for the type of content that you can play on them. In fact, in just the medium performance mode with the fan on quiet, the Retroid Pocket Mini has handled pretty much all of what I can throw at it in terms of PS2 and GameCube. So talking about screens on both of these devices, you know, it's hard to compare OLED versus IPS, there's clear advantages in color and contrast on the OLED, but still a good panel down here on the micro. I think that if this had a release in a vacuum without the mini existing, it would have been a lot more attractive. Unfortunately, this has stolen a little bit of that thunder from the mini micro, small, tiny, teeny tiny, big macro, whatever the heck this is called. I set up the brightness of both devices before filming to make sure that they were exposed almost exactly the same for the camera. You can see here the RP Mini is a little less than half on the brightness meter and the micro is almost maxed out. I will say, however, that the Mini, most of the brightness changes happen down at the bottom here. From halfway to full is to less change than from a quarter to halfway. So, I mean, here's full. It's a little oversaturated, a little blown out. You can tell from the gamepad tester here. But if we do full on the micro, 
These are both on their maximum brightness and you can see how much more washed out this is showing that it's just that much brighter. Let's also check their respective minimums. We take the minimum mini all the way down and you can only see the faintest outline there. And we take the micro all the way down. If the brightness meter, okay, wow. Get with it, Derek. Are you freaking, okay, there we go. Ha <laughs> uh, I think I can see it less. I think the micro actually gets dimmer than the mini. You probably can't see either on the camera. Let me see, turn off my light here for a second. And then I'm going to increase the exposure on the camera here. I'm gonna to go to f2.8 and we were previously at four. No, we're gonna f2, four times as much light as previous. And you can see here now, pardon the camera wobble, that this is still brighter and the micro is still darker here. So I guess if you're playing in a pitch black environment, this can get darker, although OLED has that awesome ability for the blacks to just disappear. So maybe a bit of a wash there, but both of these devices are perfectly suitable for low light environment playing. All right, so to wrap up what we have talked about today, I think the bottom line is most people are gonna be more happy with the Retroid Pocket Mini than the Micro. I was really excited for this handheld when it was first announced. And unfortunately, victim to INEO's delays, the Retroid Pocket Mini kind of came in and took the thunder of the small, more premium device category. No, it's not the perfect aspect ratio for Game Boy Advance, but you can almost forgive that with the bezels that nearly disappear. And I think the black model is superior there just because you don't see them as much with the gray, then you'll have you know, more of a significant black outline or the Saturn white, but you know, that's up to a user preference. For 4.3 games, obviously this is better. For 16.9 and 3.2 games, I like how compact that the micro is. I love the finish and feel of the micro. You know, I think they're relatively the same price and for here a little bit more of the money goes to the CPU and here a little bit more of the money goes to the design and build materials. So it's a bit more of a premium feel versus most power for the budget possible. You know, I'm still bitter about the face buttons on the mini. They're just so much quieter here on the micro. I really, if the, if these buttons and D-pad were on this, I might never buy another small handheld, but these buttons kind of piss me off. So it, keep an eye on the channel. I have ordered replacement button sets for the Retroid Pocket Mini. They haven't shipped out from Retroid yet, but when they arrive, I think I'm gonna open the sucker up and see if I can take one of the sets of buttons and like shave them down, maybe 3D print and model something different. I don't really wanna mess with it until I've got some replacements, but yeah, keep an eye out and hopefully I can come up with a mod that makes these buttons a little less offensive to use. As some people have said that they kind of like the tactility and, and don't mind it, but I, I personally am borderline hating these buttons and borderline, not even borderline, I am loving these buttons. I, I wish I could get these buttons on more devices. These maybe are the best face buttons that INEO has ever done at least on a small device. They're way better than the Pocket Air and its buttons. In fact, the Pocket Air buttons almost kind of remind me of what's on the Mini here. OLED is great, the screen size is great, performance is great, the joysticks are better. It's really a hard sell at this point to go for the Micro unless, again, Game Boy Advance, premium build quality and size. And I have spent $200 of my own money on both of these devices, and I'm probably gonna be selling the Micro and keeping the Mini. Though I may also sell the mini and opt for something larger like the Retroid Pocket 5 is having the ultimate small handheld isn't always necessary for me. And when I really want small, honestly, I still have my trusty RG28XX because this really fits in your pocket, no joysticks. There's kind of no competition for something like the 28XX or the Miu A30. Just saying that if you truly want small and perfect screen or performance isn't there, you know, you can consider an option like that. So what do you all think? Do you think that the micro is dead in the water now that the mini is out? Do you think that it still has a place in your collection? Are the face buttons and D-pad enough to redeem it versus the Retroid Pocket Mini? Or is it just too little too late compared to the mini? Let me know your thoughts down in, down, 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 down in the comments and we'll take a look. Let me know what you think.